click the record button. Here we go. So uh, thank you everybody for coming for our weekly uh, seminar at the Department of Financial Sciences. Uh, today we land back in Israel. As you know, we are moving between time zones in the planet and well, today we are in Israel. With then we are very honored to host uh, Dr. Kariri Lisa Haspel from the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the Uni Institute of Earth Sciences, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So Karen Elisa, background is that um, she uh, completed in 93, a BA at R Rutgers University, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, uh, high honors in physics and highest honors in, from Rutgers College. In 97, a PhD at the University of Chicago, the Department of Geophysical Sciences, uh, under the uh, mentorship of Professor John Frederick. Uh, in between 1997 and 1999, she continued into a uh, um, visiting scientist at the postdoc at a postdoctoral, postdoctoral level at Princeton University in the program in atmospheric and ocean sciences and geophysical fluid dynamic laboratory. And then uh, another year at, in Israel at the department at the Hebrew University in Jer in Jerusalem between 99 and 2000 uh, as a postdoc. And since then she is at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, from the long list of uh, um, honors and awards, I can select some as uh, for instance, the Golda Meir Postdoctoral Fellowship in 2000 the Schindler Prize in 2001, and um, the first prize of, for extended abstract at Ocean Optics in Montreal in Quebec, as well as Citation for Excellence in Teaching, several of those, by the way, in 2014, 2015. I will definitely take one of your courses then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today we are hosting virtually, hopefully soon we'll be uh, in person, uh, Kieran and Elisa, uh, who is going to talk about scattering of electromagnetic radiation by porous and amorphous atmospheric aeros aerosols. So we're moving a little bit to the atmosphere above the ocean. Okay, so Karen and Elisa, the podium is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, everyone can see my presentation? Yeah, we see. Great. Okay, so this is uh, a, a set of uh, a few projects that we've done uh, over recent years with a few of my students and other colleagues. So first, just a few words of motivation. Uh, on the right, we have a, a figure that's typically shown in introductory courses on climate, uh, showing the transfer of energy within the Earth atmosphere system, beginning with uh, energy that we receive from the sun, and then transferred energy in different directions. And what we have here is the amount of energy transferred uh, relative to 100% energy that's incident from the sun. And the takeaway message from this figure is that actually every arrow here is energy that's transferred, transferred in the form of electromagnetic radiation, except for just two arrows, one for sensible heat transfer and one for latent heat transfer. All the others are transfers of energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So clearly an understanding of how energy flows uh, as electromagnetic radiation is essential to understanding the climate uh, of the earth. And aside from the sun and other things that influence uh, the transfer of radiation, uh, I particularly focus on the influence of particles on this radiation. These particles can be as small as molecules or aerosol particles of different types, cloud drops, raindrops, ice crystals. And they influence uh, the transfer of radiation by scattering the radiation into different directions and by absorbing the radiation. On the left, we have uh, a figure showing the types of scattering and the uh, essentially how much scattering depending on the size of what's doing the scattering from the smallest, uh, which are air molecules, up to drizzle and raindrops, uh, which are of the largest particles that we investigate. Okay, so a little bit of a historical perspective, how we go about calculating scattering and absorption of electromagnetic radiation by particles. And I'm actually going to talk not just about um, 
aerosol particles in the atmosphere, but also hydrosol particles uh, in the ocean. And uh, starting in 1908, when Gustav Mee published a, a landmark paper where he presented an analytical solution of Maxwell's equations uh, for the scattering in, uh, of electromagnetic radiation by the particle. In his solution, he described a homogeneous sphere, which is um, the easiest problem to solve. Nevertheless, it was rather complicated and um, was quite an accomplishment for the time. And to this day, is still cited. It took some time from 1908 till the early 1980s um, to come up with an efficient way of computing the, uh, the scattering of electromagnetic radiation, even though Gustav Mee presented his analytical solution back in 1908. So in the early 1980, 1980s, we had the first um, stable algorithm for doing the computation. And this was by Craig Boren and Donald Huffman. And it's called uh, BH me, B for Boren, H for Huffman, and me for Gustav me. And in fact, uh, to this day, no other algorithm that calculates single scattering is so stable and robust. And for decades, BH me and similar algorithm, algorithms have dominated calculations of scattering by atmospheric aerosol. And not just atmospheric aerosol, also oceanic hydrosols and particles in other fields. Indeed, some particles do resemble homogeneous spheres. For example, cloud drops or raindrops, water drops in general tend to be spherical. Uh, we also have particles in the atmosphere that are solutions of water with sulfuric acid or ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate or sea salt. And these can be also uh, roughly spherical. Likewise, we have some liquid phase organic uh, components in the atmosphere. And these are also roughly, roughly spherical as is shown in this image here. However, many particles are not spherical. So for example, in the upper panel, we have some images of soot. And in the lower panel, we have some images of dust of various uh, shapes and sizes. Moving from soot and dust to ice particles, these are illustrations of the shapes of ice particles, which are not spheres at all, various crystalline shapes. And then we can actually move into the, the oceans. So in bodies of water, we find uh, hydrosol particles of all different shapes and sizes, uh, almost none of which are even nearly spherical. So what can we do if we have non-spherical inhomogeneous particles? So one idea is, well, let's try to force them to be homogeneous spheres by creating spheres that have equivalent volume or equivalent surface area. Or another technique is called an effective medium approximation or EMA or electromagnetic mixing rule where we take a mixture of either different components if it's non-homogeneous or a mixture of the component and air if it's, homo if it's um, non-spherical and compute some effective refractive index or effective, uh, effective permi uh, permittivity uh, of the material. And then we can take either our equivalent volume spheres, equivalent surface area spheres, or our effective medium approximation and couple it with BHME and get the scattering and absorption from these particles. All of these are obviously approximate approaches. Just to mention some of the more popular effective medium approximations, one is called the Brueggemann approximation or Brueggemann EMA, one is called Maxwell Garnet, and one is called the molar refractivity EMA. And all of these are some average over either the permittivity or the refractive index of the material where we put uh, the actual volume fraction of each material uh, into the average. And this is usually symbolized F. So we have F here and F here. If those uh, techniques are not good enough, Another idea is to take some other regular shape that we can solve analytically. So since Gustav Mies' time in 1908, other, other shapes have been solved. For example, a coated sphere, a multilayer sphere, a spheroid, a coated spheroid, an infinite cylinder. So sometimes some of the shapes that we look at are similar enough to one of these other, uh, other regular shapes that have been solved and we can use that analytical solution. Of course, not every particle fits one of these shapes either. And interestingly, even though we have analytical, analytical solutions for these shapes, we can't always do the computation. We can't always take the analytical solution and actually compute 
the scattering and absorption by that shape. One of the things I mentioned here, the multilayer sphere, I'm going to mention again. So first, I'll just show uh, an illustration. Uh, a sequence of papers by Vishinikov et al. Uh, tested the idea of using multilayered spheres to describe any inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous particle, inclu including porous particles, even though this kind of configuration doesn't really resemble most of the particles we looked at. It doesn't resemble these kind of particles or these kind of particles or these kind of particles. Uh, but Vishinikov et al. found that in some cases, the result that they got by using layered spheres was close enough to, uh, to a measured result. Another idea is called optically soft particle theory, and it's actually a heading under which there, are, there is more than one theory. And I'm going to mention specifically what's called the rayleigh debye gans approximation or RDG approximation. The idea is to take a scatter or whatever shape it is and divide it up into very small pieces, which we call spherules, especially if they're roughly spherical shaped. And we assume that they're so small that they behave as if they were dipoles. And also that the whole collection of these spherules is optically thin. And then we describe the fact that the incoming radiation will hit the spherules and activate them. And then they'll start to radiate and they'll radiate as dipoles will. It's an approximation because they do not activate one another. In other words, there's no interaction from one dipole to the next, but all of them are activated by the in incoming electromagnetic wave and all of them radiate outward. So the rayleigh debye gans approximation is an interesting idea. It's worth uh, testing and sometimes works well. However, it's we can understand that these uh, optically soft particle theories are not applicable for all refractive indices. So what else can we try? If we happen to have very large scatterers, there are a number of techniques that are appropriate. Monte Carlo techniques, ray tracing techniques, techniques, uh, the geometric optics approximation, and variations thereof. And these are appropriate only when the particle sizes are large and not when they're small. And then we get to a large list of more exact theories. They come under the heading of either finite difference techniques or volume integral equation methods or surface integral equation methods. There are many, many of these, and these are considered more exact. In fact, these are considered um, exact solutions to Maxwell's equations but they're semi-analytical, semi-numerical. And unfortunately, they tend to fail or at least become computationally impractical above a certain particle size. Among all of these methods, I've highlighted two of them, the discrete dipole approximation and the superposition T-matrix method, which I'm going to mention again. So let's talk about the discrete dipole approximation. And it's actually the coupled version of the RDG approximation. So just a reminder, what did we just say about the RDG approximation? That we describe our scatterer as a collection of small pieces, spherules that are dipole sized and are activated by the incoming electromagnetic wave. The difference is in the discrete dipole approximation, we do allow dipoles to activate one another, to radiate on one another. The interaction among the dipoles is full. Because we have full coupled interaction among the dipoles, we have a large set of coupled equations and we have to solve them. And in conventional implementations of the DDA, this is usually done uh, solving a matrix equation. So this is a good idea. It's considered an exact solution. It's called approximation just because we're dividing up, uh, breaking up our total scatterer into small pieces. But if we break them up, break it up into small enough pieces and uh, succeed in solving this equation, it's considered actually an accurate solution. However, this scheme doesn't run uh, on a given computer architecture if there's not enough memory for such a large matrix, and that can happen pretty easily. And it even fails above a certain particle size, even if there's enough memory. So the first thing I'm going to show you that's from my group is an idea that instead of relying on having to solve a large set of coupled equations and having to invert a, a large matrix that we're holding in memory. We're going to use what's called the scattering order formulation of the discrete dipole approximation. And the idea is, instead of solving all of the coupled equations simultaneously, 
we're going to iterate over orders of scattering. So we have the incident plane coming in, it activates the dipoles, and they all radiate outward, but at the first, uh, in the first order of scattering, they don't radiate on one another. So we'll call this the first order. Then we allow each dipole to radiate on every other dipole, but only once. And then they radiate outward, and this is the second order of scattering. And then, so, and so on. We'll allow each dipole to radiate on every other dipole a second time. All dipoles radiate outward, and this will be the third order of scattering. And we continue until we've uh, uh, covered enough orders of scattering to get an accurate solution. This actually is not new, uh, a new idea. Uh, in fact, Boren, the same Boren of the BHME code, uh, tried this back in the late 1980s and found that the, the scheme works sometimes, but it fails to converge above a certain particle size. So we repeated uh, this original scattering order of formulation using a little bit more modern computational techniques, and we found the same thing, that above a certain particle size, what we get is a divergence of the scheme instead of a convergence. What I'm showing here in this graph is the extinction cross-section. Extinction is the sum of scattering and absorption. So that's on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the iteration number or the order of scattering. And you can see that we have two attempts shown here that are not converging to any number, certainly not converging to the correct answer, which are these dashed lines, but rather are diverging. Not only diverging, but are reaching negative numbers, which uh, it makes no physical sense. You can't have a, a negative cross-section. So basically, we confirmed that even with a little bit more modern uh, computational techniques, uh, the original scheme of Boren and his colleagues uh, does fail above a certain particle size. So then we came up with a variation on that idea, which we call the marching scattering order formulation. A lot of uh, acronyms here. Uh, which is basically the scattering order formulation, but with causality. So we have the same idea of the incident plane wave coming in and hitting the dipoles, but we only allow the incident plane wave to hit one side of the particle first, a wall of dipoles that it will first encounter, and only these dipoles get their first order dipole moments. Then the wave advances according to the speed of propagation of the electric, an electromagnetic wave, according to the speed of light, and the second wall will get its dipole, uh, its first order dipole moments, while the first wall is getting its second order dipole moments, and so on. So we advance the wave, not only the incident wave, but also any wave that's scattered from each dipole uh, in a causal fashion, where all waves propagate at the speed of light and don't encounter uh, another dipole until they can actually uh, could actually have reached the other dipole. So when we do that, we find, first of all, that the curves as a function of scattering order are smoother. It looks a little bit more physical uh, and not just some jagged numerical scheme. Um, however, it, doesn't, it still doesn't always converge. This black curve is an example of it still diverging. On the other hand, we found that sometimes we did get convergence. For example, this blue curve is an example of a calculation that failed when we used the original scheme but did converge with our new scheme. So we found that with this idea of the marching scattering order formulation, in some cases, we could expand the, the region of valid, uh, validity of the scattering order formulation and achieve convergence. Because we didn't get convergence in all cases, we wanted to understand a little bit better why, why there is this divergence. And to this end, we did some more simulations with the scattering order formulation. So what we're showing here is for a specific radius, we're showing the first four orders of scattering, first order, second order, third order, and fourth order. We have two scattering order formulation calculations, which I'm not going to go into detail what the difference is, but the blue and red are the scattering order uh, formulation calculations. And the correct answer is the green curve. And what we see is if the radius of the scatterer is small enough, uh, the curves tend to behave well within four orders of scattering, we've almost converged onto the correct answer. As we increase the radius of the scatterer, what we find is at in the third and fourth orders of scattering, we start to get this difference between the correct answer, which is the green curve, and our two SOF curves um, that are not entirely problematic in the sense that this particular run will go on to converge eventually. But we, we start to see a little bit of a problem that for some reason is a particular problem in the backscattering direction. 
as we increase the size of the, the scatterer, we see that this problem in the backscattering direction becomes much more severe. And now the, the graphs that we're showing are actually uh, log scale. So we're, we have orders of magnitude difference in the backscattering direction. Again, this is the correct answer. And these are our simulations with the scattering order formulation. So we have almost two orders of magnitude difference uh, in the backscattering direction. And what's interesting is the forward scattering direction is actually quite good. It almost looks as if if we were only paying attention to the forward scattering direction, we would get convergence. But in the backscattering direction, the entire backscattering hemisphere, there's a lot of, uh, th there's a, this enormous difference. So the backscattering hemisphere is particularly problematic. And we increase the size of the scatterer and we see this problem all, is only magnified even more. Um, now almost three orders of magnitude difference uh, in the entire backscattering hemisphere. So first of all, we discovered that uh, backscattering is particularly problematic, while at the same time forward scattering is not problematic. So there's something with backscattering that causes problems in the scattering order formulation. So we came up with an idea, uh, yet another variation on the scattering order formulation, which we call downward recursion. First, I'll show the results and then I'll explain what, what we mean. So again, uh, go back two slides, and what I'm showing is the same fourth panel with this two order of magnitude difference between the, the, the regular scattering order formulation and the correct answer. So it's the same color scheme. Here's the regular scattering order formulation and the green curve is the correct answer. And then when we put in this new idea of downward recursion, we get the dotted red curve or the dashed red curve, and you can see that we're at, we have now reduced to the correct order of magnitude. And we can uh, envision that which, within just a couple more orders of scattering, we'll actually get uh, convergence to the correct answer with downward recursion. When we do the same thing on the largest size, again, this is the same uh, as this figure, the fourth order of scattering. Again, these curves are the original scattering order formulation and the green curve is the correct answer. When we put in downward recursion, we either get the dashed, um, the dashed red curve, or the sorry, the dotted red curve, or the dashed red curve, and now we have the correct order of magnitude. And within some number of orders of scattering, we're likely to get convergence to the correct answer, rather than being way off uh, that in the way that the original scattering order formulation was. So what do we mean by downward recursion? So this is sort of a, just a schematic of all the ideas that I've uh, mentioned here. The original scattering order formulation where we have the incident radiation coming in and then each dipole is activated and radiates on one another and then they all radiate outward and we measure it some, uh, at, at, in, in some point in space at, in some direction. The marching scattering order formulation where just one wall at a time is activated and then starts uh, radiating outward and we measure it in a certain direction. And then we have these two which are the downward recursion ideas. And the downward recursion ideas are actually the opposite of causality. So sort of the opposite of the causality that we built into the marching scattering order formulation, where in this case, we allow the dipoles that are farthest from one another to interact with one another first and then to radiate outwards. So either halfway through the scatterer or all the way through the scatterer, these are the dipoles that we allow to, act, to, to be activated and to interact with one another first and then we move gradually inward. So it's actually a numerical trick. It's obviously not as physical as the idea of the, the fully causal marching scattering order formulation, but numerically, it clearly gives much better results. And just an aside before I move on to some more, uh, some other studies, um, finding and a computationally efficient model that's robust for all particle sizes and all particle refractive indices is, is sort of the holy grail of scattering modelers. And no one has achieved it yet. There are many groups around the world that are trying to do this, but nobody has achieved it yet. So in the meantime, we're restricted to, obviously, to applying the models that are existing and to being careful that we use the sets of parameters and particle sizes that are appropriate for these models. Okay, so let's look at some other systems. So I, now I wanna go on to the porous and amorphous or porous amorphous aerosol. And in particular, I'm gonna look at soot, some glassy organic aerosol. So organic aerosol in a glass phase and highly porous aerosol. Starting with soot. 
So the problem that went back to around 2006 was that all of the calculations of absorption by soot underestimated the measurements. The measurements were up here, 7.5 meters squared meter squared per gram, and that's what's called the mass normalized absorption cross-section. And all the calculations were something like this plot, where we have the same mass absorption cross-section on the y-axis and the diameter of the particle on the x-axis. We can see that the peak is a little bit below 7, but it doesn't get near the average of 7.5, and most of the sizes actually are, are way below the measured value of 7.5. Now, before I move on, I should say that these calculations were typically done using BHME, assuming that soot is homogeneous and spherical. But as we saw, it's not. This is what soot typically looks like. It's far from homogeneous, far from spherical. So our idea was, well, let's describe soot uh, more explicitly the way it looks. And so I'm gonna focus on this model right here, where we take the soot and we build it out of small spherules of dipole size. And that fits very well with one of the two of the models that I mentioned, the RDG approximation and the DDD DDA. And we used for this calculation the RDG approximation. So just a quick reminder, this is where we divide up the scatterer into these tiny spherules, their dipole size, and they're optically thin, so they don't interact with one another, but they do, they are activated, activated by the incoming wave, and then they radiate outward. And what we found was when we describe soot in this way, we actually reproduce very well the measured absorption. So the hatched area here are, is the same range of measurements that I showed previously. In other words, it's the same bar as shown here. And the magenta curve and the red curve are the two calculations we did with the RDG approximation. You can see that they fit for all the diameters we tested, they fit well within the range of measurements. So we found that it's a big improvement over assuming homogeneous spheres. We predict the absorption much better using the RDG approximation. Now, why could we use such an approximation and essentially not get into the higher order interactions? And it's because soot is highly absorbing. We can see this by the imaginary part of the refractive index. 0.71 is a high imaginary part of the refractive index, and therefore there's a lot of absorption in soot. We also know that because soot appears black. Um, and so that sort of um, depresses uh, higher orders of interaction and allows the RDG approximation to be accurate enough in the case of soot. However, we can imagine that the RDG approximation will not always be good enough. And when we move now to glassy organic aerosol and highly porous aerosol, uh, we find that it isn't good enough. So first of all, where do we get this glassy organic aerosol from? It's actually emitted during emitted from uh, due to natural activities and anthropog anthropogenic activities on Earth. We have these glassy aerosol components in the air. They tend to ads absorb uh, water vapor and actually become cloud drops. Sometimes if they get up into the upper atmosphere, they freeze. And sometimes at a time after that, they sublimate. And then we end up with a highly porous version. So now we're looking at actually these two types of particles, and these are actually uh, scanning electron microscope images. Here is the glassy organic par uh, particle before it absorbed the water and froze and sublimated, and this is after it absorbed the water vapor and froze and, and sublimated. So let's look at actual measurements of extinction by these kinds of particles. What we're showing here is extinction efficiency. I'll mention what that means in a moment. Uh, for each. So the solid curve is the original glassy organic aerosol. That's this particle here. And the dashed curve is the HPA, the highly porous aerosol, after the growth and freezing and sublimation. And we can see, first of all, just from the measurements that the highly porous aerosol has a much lower extinction efficiency. And that's actually even though it tends to be larger. However, what I'll show in a moment is that the RDG approximation doesn't even doesn't even predict very well this low extinction. In fact, it significantly underestimates even this lower extinction efficiency. So just a word about what do we mean by extinction efficiency? If I spoke before about the extinction cross-section, well, the cross-section is the extinction efficiency times the geometric cross-section. So actually we're taking the extinction cross-section and just dividing it by the geometric cross-section, and that's how we get the extinction efficiency. Okay, so 
what else can we use to describe the extinction by the highly porous aerosol? If the Rayleigh de Bygans doesn't pr predict this curve well, what does? So we can try some of the other ideas, effective medium approximation, approximations, the multi-layered spheres idea of Vashinikov et al, and the discrete dipole approximation, the coupled version of the Rayleigh de Bygans theory. So just a reminder again, these are the effective medium approximations. This is the multi-layered sphere idea. And the discrete dipole approximation, again, is the coupled version of the RDG approximation. So we con conducted an extensive set of calculations using all of these models. And unfortunately, we found that they, too, underestimate the extinction efficiency of highly porous aerosol. So again, the solid curve was, this, was the original glassy aerosol before the freezing and sublimation. Uh, the sort of magenta area is the measurements of the highly porous aerosol. And the blue-green dots and the blue shaded area is our calculations using all the various models. Actually, we're highlighting here the Bergman effective medium approximation, the Vashinikov model, and the DDA. You can see that we underestimate all of these models underestimate it, and pretty pretty poorly for these larger sizes. Uh, we predict only about half of the extinction. And uh, that's a pretty disappointing result, considering that especially the DTA is considered an accurate, uh, an accurate uh, model. Well, we're pretty stubborn, so we tried some more calculations. We played around with the void sizes. And we got many results, but almost all of them are too low. So even with different void sizes, our calculations underestimate the extinction efficiency of these highly porous aerosol. So then still being stubborn, we came up with another idea, which was to invent our own effective medium approximation. And we call this the apparent void polarizability effective medium approximation. And the idea was to take the voids and admit that even a void has a dipole moment. There is an induced field in a cavity and also a dipole moment that is associated with a cavity. And we can use this dipole moment inside each void to calculate a new effective uh, medium, an, an effective refractive index and effective uh, permeability, uh, permittivity, sorry. And when we do that, we get these uh, red circles. So again, the gray area is the original measurements and the uh, area of, uh, of error or the area of uncertainty in the measurements. The blue is the calculations with the DDA model, which cons is considered exact, but highly underestimated the, the measurements. And then the red is the new calculation with our new apparent void polarizability effective medium approximation. And you can see uh, it's, this is really, uh, really stands out in the largest particles that instead of predicting only half of the extinction, we actually predict exactly what the extinction should be. We're exactly within the, within the error. In fact, this value hit right on the, the, the measurement itself. Okay, now going back for a moment to glassy organic aerosol. So our last idea, the last project that we're going to mention is going back to the glassy material and trying to describe more explicitly, well, how does glassy material interact with radiation? And we know that in a glassy material, the atoms exhibit only short range order and the electrons are therefore localized. And this, of course, should affect how they scatter radiation. So to try to do a more explicit calculation on the glassy organic material, we modeled our amorphous material as an amorphous collection of scattering centers surrounded by voids. So in reality, they don't look like there's voids. This is what it looks like. But in terms of the interaction with radiation, it's as if there are voids. It's as if there are these scattering centers that are spread around and outside of the, of the points of the scattering centers, there is no scattering. We use this idea and applied an effective medium approximation or several effective medium approximations. And we also applied a model that came from the solid state physics community, uh, Stokursky's model, which is called the ideal amorphous solid model which we use to actually place the, sat the scattering centers in space. And then we use the MSTM model, the multiple sphere T matrix code to 
calculate the scattering by the pieces of material that are placed according to Stokursky's ideal amorphous solid model. Okay, so let's start with the EMA approach. So again, these are the same three EMAs that I mentioned, and we're going to use actually just two of them, the Brueggemann and the molar refractivity. And the molar refractivity is the one that until now, people who have been dealing with amorphous materials generally use the molar refractivity effective medium approximation, and they generally recommend it as, as the most uh, practical and most successful uh, effective medium approximation. However, when we did the calculation, we found that that's not true. Actually, the Brueggemann effective medium approximation uh, matches measurements much better. So the measurements are, the, is the, are along the black solid curve. The Brueggemann effective medium approximation is the red pluses. And the molar refractivity, what people were recommending before our study, are the green triangles. And you can see that the molar refractivity effective medium approximation highly underestimates uh, the measurements whereas the Brueggemann model does very well. We also presented actually a correction to the molar refractivity EMA using an effective mass density, which greatly improved the molar refractivity EMA. But even so, the Brueggemann model is better at most points. So overall, the Brueggemann model uh, was the best. And this is a, a new result that until now um, uh, was not discovered. We found that this is true on a few different amorphous materials, amorphous silica, uh, liquid methane, as opposed to crystalline methane, and amorphous water ice, as opposed to crystalline water ice. In all cases, the Brueggemann effective of medium approximation turned out to be the best. And finally, the most explicit model that we've shown is this ideal amorphous solid model. So, this is just a, a page describing Stokursky's model. I won't go into any detail on this. And I'll just jump to what it looks like in practice. So what we did was we took many, many spherules and we placed them either in an ordered simple cubic manner to comprise a particle or in the amorphous manner according to Stokursky's model. And for every size and composition we were interested in, we had a pair, the ordered pair, the, the ordered particle and the amorphous particle. So here's just two pairs to look at. And we found something very interesting that the ordered particle, the simple cubic particle, scatters forward much more than the amorphous particle. Here's just an example. The red curve is the simple cubic, the ordered particle, and the amorphous one is the blue curve. That's in the forward, in the forward direction. In the backward direction, the opposite is true. It's the amorphous particle that scatters more and the ordered simple cubic particle that scatters less. And this repeated itself for different sizes and compositions. We did an extensive set of calculations for many different sizes and many different compositions. And we found that this is still true. The simple cubic ordered particle configuration scatters more in the forward direction. The amorphous glassy configuration scatters more to the side and in back scattering directions. Not only that, but the simple cubic ordered particles exhibit more extinction overall. They scatter and absorb more than the amorphous particles overall. So I'll just end with some final thoughts based on this very last study, which was just published two weeks ago. We find statistically significant differences between the ordered particles and the amorphous particles when we describe the scattering and absorption explicitly. And we think these differences could be relevant to the problems describing the scattering and absorption by highly porous aerosol. This freeze drying process might leave the HPA in a much more ordered uh, configuration than we described previously. These differences could also be important to correctly predicting the climate effect of glassy aerosol, because we need to know in a given glassy aerosol, how much of the spherules look like this and how much of the spherules look like this, and it can have an a significant effect on the overall climate effect. And the last thing I'll mention is that we're not only doing these theoretical calculations, we're in the process of comparing our calculations against additional measurements from Dan Sitso's group. He's uh, at MIT and Purdue University. So we hope to find some even more interesting results when we compare against measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen Elisa. It was really um, 
interesting and different for us marine sciences. I open the, the podium for question. I have some, but I will wait to be the last. Yeah, yeah really um, one has a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was really a very nice talk. Sorry, I just have a quick question, although it may be two if the time permits me. In the modeling of your suit, you assume that the particles are homogeneous, where in reality it is inhomogeneous. So I want to know, how do you correct for the assumption in your results? Uh, okay, so in our results, we actually did not assume they're homogeneous. So the, the results we were trying to uh, correct or do a better job of, all right, uh, the, hmm? these calculations yeah. Yeah. were assuming they're homogeneous and they got the wrong answer. When we, when we did our calculation, we built the soot in this way. We made, we actually built our particles to look like this. So that's why we got a better, a better answer that it was not homogeneous. Then again, um, maybe in your slide 18 or something where you are trying to determine the convergence stance of the particles. So although the particles are expected to converge, but in your model, they are actually diverging. Is that behavior typical of the particular sizes of particle? Uh, yeah, the question is, <laughs> if we have divergence, um, is it typical of the sizes we're interested in? And unfortunately, yes. Um, on the one hand, there are quite a number of size of types of particles that we do want to know that are smaller and we can calculate their, their scattering and absorption very well. But there are also plenty of particles that are in the size range that we can't calculate. And that's a problem. So what people do is you can use a very fancy model such as such as these kinds of models to to calculate up to a certain size uh, and then for larger sizes we revert back to a homogeneous sphere because we have no no other model that will work above a certain size. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Lisa. If somebody else has questions. Mm. Okay, and if people think on a question, I will ask mine. Um, I'm coming from the paleo record and um, using uh, marine or lake sediments to, to understand um, the climate. And one of the issues that in climate past, past climate, uh, Studies is using um, it's tracking after past records of dust, right, in the atmosphere, which basically are aerosols, right. So I just wonder if different, I mean, different type of dust will be different type of um, more or less potential for clouds, right, and eventually precipitation. So my question or my question coming from a total ignorance on this matter is if rather you will have calcium carbonate as dust coming from, from the desert, let's say, or silica will be different potential for producing clouds, or it will be the same potential according to the size of the mineral, or I mean, I'm just questioning. Yeah, in fact, um, there are several scientists who most of their career uh, was spent working on sizes and types of dust and how that influences the scattering mm -hmm. and absorption. And um, indeed, you can find very detailed calculations according to exactly what minerals are in the dust and exactly what shapes and exactly what sizes, again, up to the size that we can calculate. Uh, and there are some differences. However, um, my recollection is the differences are are relatively small, all things considered, considering all the un other uncertainties we have <laughs> in uh, in climate calculations. Um, the, the differences are quite small, except when iron oxides are involved. So if we have mineral compositions with iron oxides, then we get a significant difference in the absorption. And and that that really is important to make sure we get um, we get correct. Okay. 
Interesting. And the second question is that actually just recently, I think last week, I saw a paper that they discover microplastics as aerosols in, in a station in the Pyrenees, which is something like 3,000 meters above sea level. So I wonder if this is something also that um, atmospheric scientists are working on, uh, microplastics, the influence of microplastic in the atmosphere and how, how high they can get, actually. Yes, the, the answer is yes. And in fact, I had a slide uh, about microplastics and I took it out because I just thought I had too many slides already. Um, but the truth is yes. In fact, uh, a week ago uh, at the American Geophysical Union meeting, there was, a, I think, a whole session just on microplastics in the atmosphere and oceans. Um, so yes, it's something that, that uh, seems to be important. And in fact, um, we had an idea. We haven't um, suggested it yet or, or submitted a proposal, but we had an idea that um, this kind of modeling might be appropriate for the microplastics, that they are sort of amorphous or, or glassy in terms of the, the configuration of the material in, on a, in a microscopic, mi microscopic view. And we had an idea that once we get uh, a robust set of calculations that are kind of purely theoretical and not uh, particularly applied to a specific particle that we would also look at microplastics. Hmm. So I just wonder also for the sake of my curiosity, how high they can get actually? Do we know? They can get to the Everest, I mean, and just really for the sake of my curiosity. Probably many. <laughs> um, I, would, I would think that they could. I mean, just based on um, the fact that particles can reach the tropopause, I think they can, um, of course, it, it depends on the size, but they, 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 microplastics tend to be quite small. That's the, the whole point, right? They keep um, right. disintegrating into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so I think just looking at how um, the transport of other th particles that we know of that can go not only you know around the globe over time, but uh, fill the entire troposphere until they settle out. My guess is yes, that they they could reach pretty high altitudes given the right conditions of transport. So potentially is leading to a total. The more we add of aerosols to the atmosphere, basically we are changing the climate in many aspects. We are generating more nucleations of clouds, right? Yes, they affect, uh, I didn't even talk about the microphysics of, of cloud formation, but it certainly uh, would also affect, could also affect uh, cloud formation um, and could affect the radiative balance. If there are enough particles, um, more scattering, more absorption would change the, you know, the, the, the radiative energy in, in the atmosphere, yeah. which would affect the climate. Um, and there, there are some studies on glassy organics and how they affect clouds. So um, I imagine that those same people would maybe are already working on the microplastics mm, yeah. as well. Yeah, and I will probably. also, yeah, and I'll, I'll also mention that there are also not only suggestions, but I think experiments going on in the direction of micro, of uh, what would, geoengineering, um, using particles to block some radiation and cool uh, cool the atmosphere. Um, so we know we know that particles can do that to the extent that people are actually experimenting with it now. Throw a layer of particles over a certain area, how much can we cool the atmosphere by doing that? Uh, so it could be that microplastics are, are already doing this. Interesting. This will certainly be something that will occupy scientists for the next decades. <laughs> yes, and, and even though I, I of course, uh, work on the radiative aspects, it also is worrisome to me that it gets in, into the, uh, has ecological effects, that, it, that it's uh, not just in the air, but in the oceans and the... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, somebody else has questions. Mm. What? Karina and Lisa, again, thank you very much.
for uh, being with us, even virtually. Would you be interested to stay in the mailing list for future events, perhaps? Sure, I'd be happy to be on the mailing list. Yeah. Okay, great, fantastic. So, um, excellent. We, we then conclude with uh, today's seminar. And thank you again. And we are meeting next week in a new, I think it's already a new, a new year. 22, I think. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. See thank you, you for inviting me and Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year and bye bye, everyone.